So one way of thinking about the logical paradox is, uh, it seems to me, is to start with a little story that Cervantes tells in his book Don Quixote. And there's a point in Don Quixote where he leaves Sancho Panza as governor of Barataria, uh, and they play some tricks on him while he's, while he's uh, governor. They wake him up very early in the morning and take him off. They say, before breakfast, you have to go and judge this case in the law courts. And you know there's a lot of vagabonds around in, in Spain at the moment who have to be very careful about people. And there's a landowner who has a river in the middle of his property and there's a bridge across the river. And to make sure that everyone is bona fide, he puts a gallows next to the bridge and a gatekeeper, a bridge keeper, who challenges everyone who comes to, to say what their business is and where they're going. And if they speak truly, they're allowed to cross the bridge. But if they lie, uh, then they're hung on the gallows. Uh, and that's, that's fine, it sorts out the vagabonds from the, the real merchants, until one day someone comes along and says, uh, my purpose is to die on those gallows and nothing else. And the bridge keepers are a bit struck by this because they think, uh, well, if we hang him, he'll have spoken the truth. And so we should have let him pass across the bridge. But if we let him pass across the bridge, he'll have lied, and so we should have hung him. So, Sancho Panza, how should we judge this case? Uh, and it takes a while for, for Sancho Panza to appreciate the paradox, uh, but eventually he gives his judgment, which is to uh, hang the half of him that lied and let the half of him that, crossed, that, that, that spoke the truth cross the bridge. Well, that sounds like a sort of party trick in a way, but um, in, in, in terms of people who want to think about truth um, and reference and, and language and so on, it actually indicates something rather troubling about the nature of language. It seems too easy to get ourselves involved in a paradox. We just don't know whether this proposition that the man said was true or false. Was he lying or not? Uh, and that goes right back to original liar paradox, which is told by Eubulides in the 4th century BC. And he got it down to a fine art. He simply said, think of the sentence, I'm lying. Now, if I say I'm lying, of course, I might be referring to some other utterance I've made. But if he's really careful, he can say, no, I'm simply lying in this very utterance I've made now. Uh, this utterance that I'm, may, may say, uh, that I'm making now is false. And then again, you think about it and you say, well, if it was true, then since it says it's, he's saying it's, it's false, it follows that it's false and not true. So it can't be true, it must be false. But then if it is false, since he said that it was false, that he's lying, it must be true. So we have the paradox encapsulated neatly in one utterance. There's a whole variety of logical paradoxes like this. Uh, and you can see why they're called logical paradox, because there's a, a logic behind working out the contradiction that's involved. Uh, uh, some people would have heard of Epimenides. And Epimenides was a Cretan, and he was very disappointed in his compatriot's ability to tell the truth. And he said, all Cretans are liars. Now, if he was right that all Cretans were liars, all other Cretans always lied, then his own utterance must be paradoxical. Because if he says all Cretans are liars, he's saying that his own utterance in particular is false. But that means that all Cretans were liars, in which case he was telling the truth when he said that all Cretans were liars. The way out, of course, is that some other Cretan sometime spoke the truth, and then what he said would be simply false and not paradoxical. So we have this whole variety of paradoxes. There's a quite nice paradox that I enjoy. There's a postcard here, and on one side of the postcard it says, the sentence the, on the other side of this postcard is true. And you turn it over and it says, the sentence on the other side of this postcard is false. And if you think about it, uh, that's simply paradoxical, because if the sentence on the first side is true, then one on the other side is true, because it says it's true, but it says it's false, so if it's true, it's false. 
Well, that's impossible, so it must be false. But it says that the sentence on the other side is false. So it can't be false. The one on the other side must be true. But we saw that when it said it was true, it was false. And so we have a neat paradox. And uh, a number of medi med med medieval thinkers who thought about this you know, rather like to put this in terms of uh, Socrates, and Pla uh, Socrates and Plato, or Plato and Aristotle sometimes. So um, Plato was Aristotle's teacher and thought that Aristotle was his best pupil. So he said, everything Aristotle says is true, but Aristotle wasn't a very good pupil in a way that he wanted to challenge Plato's doctrine. So he said, what, so what Plato says is false. And it, so it's very like the postcard paradox uh, that you get with the Plato-Aristotle paradox. So we get a lot of paradoxes in that area around truth um, and uh, lying and, and, and so on, language. But in the 20th century, uh, we were faced with a number of paradoxes in mathematics. Uh, so the brief history of that is that uh, following the invention of the calculus and then in the 18th century dealing with infinite series, uh, the foundations of mathematics were thought to be rather insecure. People wanted to say, well, how, you know, how, how do these infinite series work so that they don't lead us to contradictions in, in mathematics? And there was a big movement in the 19th century to try and find a, a firm foundation for mathematics. And that firm foundation, uh, at the time, uh, ended up being based on the theory of sets. So sets are collections where you define a collection by having some property. You say, Let, let's take the, the set of all natural numbers or the set of even numbers, or we might take the set of rice puddings. You know, very, you know lots of sets, but in mathematics, of course, they're going to be pure sets of, of, of numbers. And that looked very good. At the end of the 19th century, Frege, Dedekind, and a number of other thinkers had, 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 had established mathematics on what seemed like a firm foundation of a theory of sets. And then Bertrand Russell, who was a famous uh, British philosopher, uh, when he was reading Frege's works, he looked at this theory that Frege had, and he's focused on, he thought about this, well, yeah, you could have a set of numbers, you could have a set of sets, you could have a set of sets that are members of themselves, you can perhaps have a set of sets that are not members of themselves. And then he thought, hang on, if I had a set of sets that weren't members of themselves, would that set be a member of itself or not? Well, if it was a member of itself, then it shouldn't be a member of itself because it was supposed to be the set of sets that aren't members of themselves. So it better not be a member of itself. But if it isn't a member of itself, then it's a set that's not a member of itself. So it should be a member of this set. Now, as I said, they look like party tricks to start with, but now we've got a paradox and a contradiction right at the heart of what was thought to be the foundations of mathematics in the early 20th century. Uh, and this was a great blow to Frege, famously. Uh, Frege was about to publish volume two of his great work of foundations, and he had to add an appendix saying, Bertrand Russell has pointed out this flaw right at the heart of my theory. I think I can solve it. And he suggested a solution, but it wasn't, in fact, uh, a viable solution, as it turned out. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, paradoxes in set theory, because there's another paradox which is actually rather entertaining and, 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 uh, uh, and leads us back to talking about the paradoxes of truth, the so-called semantic paradoxes. So about 40 years later, uh, around about 1940, a man called Haskell B. Curry, uh, uh, an American logician, mathematical logician, was thinking about Russell's paradox. And he said, well, you know, right at the heart of paradox uh, that Russell has is negation. He's talking about the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. I wonder if you can actually get this paradox to work even without using negation. Is there some way we can do that? And he thought, yes, here's a way of doing it. Let's think of the set of all sets that, if they're members of themselves, then naught equals one. That's again, according to the theory of sets, that looks like a viable set. But now if we think about this set, if it was a member of itself, 
then it would be such that it would satisfy the condition that if it's a member of itself, then naught equals one. But we've assumed that it is a member of itself, so it follows that naught equals one. So it, and, it, and, and it seems pretty obvious that naught can't equal one, so we backtrack and say, well, it can't be a member of itself. Right? Well, if it's not a member of itself, then it immediately follows that either it's not a member of itself or naught equals one. If it's not a member of itself, it follows that either it's not a member of itself or naught equals one. But that's the same as saying, if it's a member of itself, it is naught, it, naught it does equal one. Right? That's the same to say either it's not a member of itself or naught equals one. It's saying, if it's a member of itself, that is, if it's not the case that it's not a member of itself, then naught equals one. But now it satisfies the condition to be a member of itself, and so we've proved that it is a member of itself. But now, having shown it's a member of itself, it follows that it satisfies the condition that if it's a member of itself, naught equals one. Help, we've proved that naught equals one. And so we have a real horrible contradiction and paradox right at the heart of mathematics again. And a few, a few years later, people translated that paradox back into the semantic paradoxes uh, that, we, th th that I was talking about earlier. And then we put it into the form, look at the sentence that says, if this sentence is true, then naught equals one, or even if this sentence is true, then God exists. And then we can give a proof in just a few lines that God exists, or anything else we like to take. Um, uh, naught equals one, God exists, uh, today it's raining in Moscow. We can prove anything we like with such a sentence. And people who think about truth say, well, this is very dangerous. You know, is truth really like that? Is truth an inconsistent concept? And I'll, I'll perhaps finish up by talking briefly about the Noah paradox, just to show that these paradoxes uh, ramify a bit further than that. Um, so now think about the sentence, you do not know this proposition. This, this proposition I've added, I say, you do not know it. Now suppose you do know it. Well then, knowledge entails truth. You can only know things that are true. So if you know it, then it's true in which case you don't know it, because that's what it says. So if you assume that you know it, it follows you don't know it. But now let's think about, you don't, we've proved you don't know it, but it said that you don't know it. That's what it said. So we've proved it. Well, surely if we prove something, we've proved something's true, then we do know it. We've got a proof of it. And so we've actually proved that you do know this proposition, as well as the fact that you don't know this proposition. So we have a, uh, an epistemic paradox. Uh, so you know, briefly to sum up, you know, I've described a number of semantic paradoxes, mostly to do with truth. I've then shown that they are very similar to some set theoretic paradoxes at the heart of the foundations of mathematics. And actually, they ramify out. There are also epistemic paradoxes, which, raise, uh, which apply to concepts like knowledge, as well as concepts like truth. To sum up what I've been saying, I mean, I've been describing a number of semantic paradoxes, like the liar paradox and Epimenides paradox and the postcard paradox that apply to the concept of truth. We're talking about lying and truth and falsehood and so on. And then I described a number of set theoretic paradoxes which arise in mathematics. And then at the end, I, just, I discussed also the Noah paradox, uh, epistemic paradoxes. Uh, well, you can immediately see, I think, how these are important that we find some solution to them as far as mathematics is concerned, because we were looking for a basis of mathematics that was firm and sound, would make sure we didn't make any mistakes in mathematics, and we have contradiction right at the heart of the foundations. So we certainly need a solution as far as the mathematical ones are concerned, the set theoretical ones. But also in terms of the semantic paradoxes, uh, the concept of truth is something that philosophers think about, they want to give a, an account of the nature of truth. What is it for a proposition to be true? Uh, the natural thought is that a proposition is true just if things are as it says they are. Well, look at the liar paradox. You know, that's true if I'm lying. Well, that's immediately paradoxical and leads to contradiction. So we need to rethink the concept of truth, 
Some people want to rethink the logic that lay behind it and the, you know, the methods of reasoning that were used to get the contradiction. Uh, and it's important that we do that if we're really to get a proper understanding of the concepts of truth and knowledge.